Alright, so our next look at this uh, pairing of original movies with their remakes. We, I figured we'd go into the 50s and the 90s and talk about something that we don't really talk about that often, I feel like, which is uh, the romantic comedy. And uh, both of them come from very acclaimed and beloved directors um, with Billy Wilder and Sidney Pollock. And as far as there being some sort of approach to this, it would seem like this is kind of an odd movie to remake, and Sidney Pollock even went into it, like, hesitantly, and I, I think even actually turned it down at one point, basically saying, like, it's, it'd be really hard to remake it in the 90s without it seeming really dated. So it's actually really interesting to skip forward to the 90s and see how many, like, actual updates they really made to it without it, w with it more or less still being the same story and kind of still feeling like the same movie in a way. Um, this is yet another instance where... It's very clear, it, like, it, when you look at just the bare bones style of it, they're exactly the same movie, but when you're actually looking at the movies themselves, they actually do feel quite different in many different aspects also. But, um, to start off with, obviously, it's based on the Samuel Taylor play, which, to my understanding, he was a co-writer on the script for the original movie, but then kind of backed his way out of it when Wilder started changing a lot of stuff. And I'm not really sure... Because it feels like I can kind of see it as a play in general, but with, I don't know, with the way we sort of bounce around a little bit, I'm, I'd be very curious to see exactly what, how exactly the play reads or what it would look like, but it, because it does translate cinematically very well, and it's one of those cases where it doesn't necessarily feel like a play despite being dialogue heavy, which I can really appreciate, but as far as, you know, remaking a movie from this era with this cast because you look at this and not only is it you know a, a director as legendary as Billy Wilder but the three main leads especially feel like how can you possibly replace them or try to top them or anything like that well for starters I think the secret weapon of the Pollock movie is that it's not really trying to top anything it's more of just kind of adapting for this sort of new era where Especially in, like, the mid-90s, the romantic comedy had really become a very recognizable thing in its form in the 90s. So, to take what we have here, I guess, I guess, uh, just immediately the first thing to start off with, which would almost be, like, the elephant in the room, is, um, how are you ever going to do, remake an Audrey Hepburn movie with somebody that isn't Audrey Hepburn? Um, then how, like how impossible that seems to even come close to that because she was just kind of her own thing all together that you just cannot replicate at all um and like even if you try to reach the charm that she could bring to the screen it's it seems like a lost cause at the start of it um and it's like like, like that even calls into question her casting in general because it's like she's supposed to play this wallflower of sorts that David doesn't even recognize at all, doesn't even really know what she looks like despite interacting with her for most of their lives. And it's like, you have to stop and think like, okay, if Audrey Hepburn is the girl living next door that likes you, or loves you even, uh, how do you just, how do you not notice? How do you not notice Audrey Hepburn? <laughs> um, and that's, that's one of the things that you kind of have to go with. Uh, it's kind of a casting thing. Like, they do... With Julia Orman, they did much more of the sort of de-glaming here, I guess you could say. It did do, like, that old trope where it's like, all the, they basically gave her glasses, and it made her, was supposed to make her seem like she was, you know, much more homely, I guess. Um, because for some reason, movies will just never understand that glasses are hot. Uh, and it's, it's, you kind of get the opposite effect. Um, but that's always been the trope, is they just take their glasses off, and suddenly they're miraculously transformed. But I guess, I guess the other thing, uh, the way that they kind of, it kind of feels like there's more of a transformation in the Pollock movie with Julia Ormond is, uh, she does have, like, that ridiculous-looking 90s hair. Um, and it is, it's to, to my understanding that they initially wanted Winona Ryder, who I could act, really see doing this, especially the sort of transformation kind of thing, but she very wisely, <laughs> um, apparently the reason she turned it down was, I don't want to try to remake Aud an Audrey Hepburn movie, and I don't want to have the pressure of trying to recreate a role like that that she did, so, uh, no thanks. Um, but there's still something that Julia Orman brought to this also, but we'll, we'll kind of get to that, uh, to the cast in general as we go down, but 
as far as some moments here, like, like literally just the opening, where it does feel like it's going to be a, an essentially a, a direct adaptation, where both movies kind of open in the same way and have really similar shots and really similar narration, with really just kind of words changed around in the narration. Um, it's it's especially well done in the original movie. I like I especially like the detail where there's apparently the family is so rich that apparently somebody has been hired with no particular title to look after a fish, just one fish. Um, and getting that whole introduction, and it does feel like we're kind of headed in exactly that same territory, almost shot for shot, when we see the opening of Pollock's movie. But then it doesn't take long for the changes to start happening, and changes where it's like. Sometimes that might seem a little unnecessary. Sometimes they're probably absolutely necessary. Like, um, obviously, one of the big things that's kind of especially odd in retrospect about the original movie was that throughout the movie, it's this it has this very light feel of a romantic comedy, despite the fact that um, Linus Larrabee is a character that I've always found a bit almost too unforgivable. Uh, for being the lead in a romantic comedy, um, but we'll get to that also. But going into what this movie does, despite being the genre that it is and the type of movie that it is, is that it begin the whole chain of events begins with a suicide attempt, which is which is very surprisingly dark, especially for a movie like this. Um, and it's like and there's there's always been that one detail that's kind of bothered me. Um, where she writes her dad a suicide note and then slips it to him. Um, and then so, after she's saved by Linus and then she goes to Paris, this suicide note is never referenced again. And surely he woke up and saw it because I don't think she would have... There was any time period in between where she could have gotten it because she was clearly in bad shape. But um, I, I don't know. But like that, that whole thing is just almost weirdly off-putting where it's not, not even just you know something like that the whole suicide never, never being mentioned again thing, but um, it, just the extreme nature of it. And it almost kind of... It, I, I would think in another instance, like if the character didn't have the charm of Hepburn or Sabrina herself, for that matter, in the writing, um, it would be very hard to accept this character as anything other than somebody that's slightly unhinged in an almost fatal attraction kind of way, because um, that's obviously exactly what Alex Forrest did, was she realized that she couldn't have Michael Douglas, so she attempted suicide as well, <laughs> and we saw where she ended up, uh, and how she ended up, so, um, but no, not that kind of movie, because uh, it's actually a romantic comedy. So, very, very wisely, in the adaptation for the 90s, we don't even go down that road at all. Um, and, and not only that, not only is it smart to just not go down that road, but the road that they decide to go down, like the scene they replace the suicide attempt with, is much more something out of a romantic comedy, where it's a case of mistaken identity, where she thinks she's talking to David when she's actually talking to Linus, and it's this embarrassing thing, and she runs out of the room, and, and that's that. Because the point, really, of the suicide attempt scene and this mistaken identity scene is to plant the seed that is Linus in this story, to plant the seed that Linus is going to be her eventual love interest in this, and to kind of introduce them in this way that's going to be memorable for both of them. Um, and yeah, the, the, honestly, um, as great in general as Wilder's movie is, of course, um, that just seems like such, <laughs> that's probably one of the better scenes of adapting it for a different era, especially, what, 40 years in between, nearly a little over 40 years in between. Um, and, yeah, so I feel like they really handled that well. Um, but then, when she goes to Paris, there's also a really big difference here, where, with Pollock's movie, it's a whole kind of section of the movie here, where it's it's essentially turns into The Devil Wears Prada, um, where not only is she kind of getting caught up in this, you know, fast lifestyle and kind of getting a makeover in that sense, uh, but we even go through that whole process of, she has somebody who kind of is above her and berates her, and that person was, you know, berated by their boss, and so, and it's kind of this chain. Um, and so the, the whole thing feels very, uh, Devil Wears Prada-esque, and then that eventually sort of gets us into her physical makeover also. Um, and, and there's a whole other thing going on where she, you know, finds another dude, and there's potential there. 
Um, and then it's like she's kind of maybe getting away from David, but also kind of not. And it's just kind of a yo-yo effect there. Um, in the uh, Pollock movie, she does seem to be, like, more aware of her obsession with David, where it's like there's the moment where they're talking about him, um, and she's ex she's explaining what David means to her, and in this moment, after a lot has happened and she's been gone for a while, she just describes him as, he keeps me company. And it's like, there, there seems to be an awareness in there in this Sabrina, um, to where it's like, I know that, you know, I don't, I don't know how much, you know, is this love, is this obsession, what is that, and like, is it maybe getting a little childish, is it getting out of control, is he just, you know, a poster on the wall at this point and really nothing else? Um, but we don't have too much of a revelation of that, that I recall in the Wilder one. Um, but it's, because both times she does learn, you know, mid-Paris that he's engaged, um, and she seems to take it much better in the Wilder version, but it's, it's hard because it feels like it's still there, because she's still very, like, basically in heaven to be back, and having just had this interaction with David on the way back. Um, and I, I guess that's another thing also, is this scene where, uh, David picks her up and brings her back, uh, and talking about the transformation kind of being more prominent in the 95 version, where it's like, it makes, she changes appearance enough in this one that it makes sense, it kind of makes sense that David doesn't recognize her the whole ride home. Um, and it's like, Audrey Hepburn is just so, obviously Audrey Hepburn, it's kind of harder to buy in this one also. Um, so it does feel like um, Pollock sort of, and the writers sort of recognized the moments that were a bit more far-fetched than this one and kind of brought them a little closer to the ground. It's still very... You just kind of have to run with it, which isn't a bad thing either. Um, but, yeah, so you can see the adaptation process in that also. Um, as far as a, a lot of other time in between here, um, the other thing I was going to mention was that we more we almost completely skip over Paris in the Wilder version. We have the couple of scenes where she's in the cooking class, but then other than that, and her writing the letter we don't really get, we just, we don't really see any of the Paris stuff. We don't really see much of the transformation in this. It's just kind of this, we meet the people that she meets, but then it just kind of goes over that, and then she's transformed. Um, and while that might help the pacing a little bit that we learned, because the 95 movie is 15 minutes longer and feels it, <laughs> um, there are a lot of things they sort of add into, add into this in between. Um, like, um, like, not only do they do we get the whole sort of Paris thing, but there's also, um, it explores the Elizabeth relationship a little more, uh, where we kind of see how David, it, how in the original movie, David kind of gets, like, pushed into it very abruptly, whereas in the 95 version, we kind of get to see him fall into it a little bit, and, like, how she's the one that proposes, but we actually get to see, like, David kind of fall for her, too, before this happens. Um, so it's like, it does feel like we kind of get a bit of a stronger feel of the characters and what exactly they're going through in this one, how they're a little bit more fleshed out in that sense. Um, and we get more of, like, the other family members, like, um, Nancy Marchand is the mom, um, who is also Tony Soprano's mom, if you don't know her by name. <laughs> um, and she's here to kind of be, like, this, you know, funny voice of reason, uh, throughout all the chaos that's happening here. Um, I like that there's more focus on Sabrina and Fairchild, her dad, um, where it's like here they kind of have, there's, there's a little bit of a tough love thing going on with the whole David thing where, uh, like that moment where her dad just kind of abruptly says, uh, how can you forget someone he doesn't know exists when she's afraid that he's going to forget her? And it's like just that sort of, and he kind of catches himself and it's this nice, funny moment, but also some kind of tough love for her. And it's after a while, especially towards the end, their relationship kind of rem starts to remind me a lot of the relationship between Harry Dean Stan and Molly Ringwald and Pretty and Pink. That's kind of the vibe I get from it, which is a really good vibe, especially for, like, father-daughter scenes that are going to be really poignant. Um, like I said, not a whole lot of that in the original. Um, we do get, like, I like the scenes with her dad and Linus in the original one, like the one where he talks about how I, I'd really rather not be working while you're, you know, courting my daughter or whatever this is. 
and then the uh, moment towards the end when he's like just kind of flat out says, you know, like you you know you don't deserve her, right? And he, even though he immediately helps him out right afterwards, but it's st there's still some power to that moment anyway. Um, that, that both he and the movie sort of recognize that. Um, and I do like the moments when um, we like where we're not really seeing the Paris stuff in the original. We're getting like we're seeing it through the perspective of the staff hearing the letters that she's sending. Um, and it's like through that and the fact that they're like kind of rooting for her to sort of get over David. It's like, th there's some really funny moments with that stuff. That's great. Um, it, so even if they're not as fleshed out, um, I do, I don't know, I still think there's something to the simplicity of those scenes where it's like, it says just enough and it kind of, it keeps the movie funny as it goes on and it kind of keeps the movie going at a good pace. Um, when obviously normally you would want, you know, more fleshed out characters like what the 95 movie is doing. Um, but like I said, I feel like the 95 movie has a bit more of a pacing problem. Uh, because it's, not only because it's 15 minutes longer, but because you can tell that it's 15 minutes longer. Um, and, and how it's, it kind of shows how much this really adds to it. Because it's, it's great that it's here, and what they're doing is good. Um, but it's like, you can kind of feel that... It feels especially like it's kind of weighing the movie down when you can see it done a bit more swiftly uh, with this one, but also to the same effect that it's still keeping, you know, the comedy alive and um, still making characters that you care about. Even if their moments in the sun are a little briefer, um, it's still... They're both still working really well. Um, what's really interesting about this is that probably, honestly, the most interesting thing when talking about these two movies and how they compare is how I'm trying to figure out how to word this exactly, but there seems to be more of a modern energy to the original version from the 50s than there is in the 90s one, for the most part, at least in the first half. It almost feels like these movies kind of switch to decades, um, because where the original movie actually feels a bit newer than it seems. Like, even when you just look at her name... Like, something that I've always found a bit sort of intoxicating about the character Sabrina, apart from, you know, Hepburn's portrayal of her, is just her name in general. Just, I, mean, I don't, I wasn't alive in the 50s, so I don't know, but he, sitting here now in the 2020s and looking back, Sabrina feels like a much more modern name than the 50s. Um, and I feel like there, there's even a reference uh, about how, like, it seems like an outlandish name uh, to one of the characters, um, I think the father character, the character that's actually not in, uh, the 95 version, um, and so, but, yeah, but it's really a lot of the movie in general, like, the way it's told sort of visually and, like, its energy, it just feels like it's newer than itself, whereas I actually feel like there's such a, a sort of old-fashioned elegance to what Pollock was bringing to the 90s version, that it's a movie that feels older than itself, like, it doesn't, it feels a little more classy than the even the like the average mid 90s romantic comedy i guess you could say and uh and it's the way we're like you'll notice that wilder got a best director nomination for the original movie and yeah the movie is really visually interesting for just sort of being a pretty straightforward movie and a pretty straightforward genre um but he makes these really fun choices like the way we're like when we're at the party and we're watching him, you know, test the plastic through it, and you can see people, like, participating in that. Even, even before that, um, there's the scene where he and David are having the conversation about Elizabeth, and in, in, in another movie, especially in another movie of this era from the 50s, you would think this would just be dialogue in a room, especially since it's a movie based on a play. Um, but to, <laughs> to what's going on throughout this whole moment where it could have just been exposition, could have just been dialogue... The whole time, you have Linus doing all these really elaborate things to the plastic <laughs> to show how durable it is, um, or it's or it's plastic in this one. It's a um, it's the sugarcane stuff uh, that's going on in this one, uh, which is the whole sort of Elizabeth merger. But um, but yeah, the way he's like he or first he uses the gun, which we do have in the '90s version. But then the over the top nature of this scene kind of stops at the gun in the remake. Uh, where this one he goes on to, he calls in about getting a bazooka, 
and then he starts jumping. He gets everybody to start jumping on it. He gets David on there, and it's like it's this really, this really ridiculous stuff is going on while this exposition and this dialogue is happening. Um, like I said, in the it, and it's visually interesting in a way, especially like um, like I was talking about seeing everything like through the windows and stuff like that at the party, and the way just some of these scenes are shot in kind of a grand way when something particularly grand isn't happening. But the movie's able to give it this sort of almost epic feel with the way they shoot it, um, and like I said, you don't. It feels much more downplayed uh, in the remake, interestingly enough, where everything does feel like it's just dialogue. It does feel a lot more like it's based on a play. Um, but I mean, there's there's still it's like the fact that it's not showy. I think is what I'm trying. That's what I'm looking for here. But um, but there is that moment where like as it at, only as it goes on. Um, does this movie kind of get to really embrace its more comedic side? It's more like, you know, out there comedic side. And this one, while still, you know, having those visual moments, um, does, and these really broad comedic moments, does find, like, a subdued elegance in it, you know, also. Um, but I think a lot of that also uh, has, has to do with the cast. Um, where, like, I was talking about how Hepburn is a presence that just can't be replicated. Um, like, there's that moment where she's, like, just dancing alone on the tennis court. Like, you can say, like, oh, how, how romantic is the scene where she and Bogart are dancing, but it's like, honestly, nothing's more romantic than this, the scene where she's dancing by herself, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, almost, almost because it feels like Sabrina would be much better off in her life if she hadn't met either of these guys, <laughs> but that's a whole other story. Um, but, yeah, so you look at that, and what you really see in Hepburn here is her the ability that she had where you look at certain actresses and they would have like at least they would have like one character and the, these were always really few and far between at least for me um, maybe this happens to people a lot but for me it feels like it's kind of rare but I really really remember it when it happens and that is when you see a character in a movie and the characters charm and just their overall feel like they, they feel so real but also so charming through the screen that you can f almost feel yourself falling in love with this fictional character along with whoever's falling in love with her in the movie um the f the, the few go-to examples i have usually that i use usually are judy holiday and born yesterday and leslie caron and lily and kate hudson and almost famous um and any other example i usually have for that is an Audrey Hepburn character. Holly Golightly, obviously, would be at the top, but I feel like Hepburn did that with just about nearly all of her characters. Um, like, she's, like, the one actress that was able to do it just, like, really consistently throughout her career. It was, like, ev pretty much every character she brought to life in some way. Um, you could imagine somebody falling for that character, and often, <laughs> often did, um, the characters in the movie, but... And just make the audience in general, like, that was her specialty, was to make the audience fall in love with her characters. And this is certainly no exception to that. Um, as far as, like, I was talking more about uh, Julia Ormond. Um, it is it is interesting that she kind of somewhat had um, a experience with taking over for Audrey Hepburn, in a way. Because um, when you look up her history... Apparently, when she really kind of started to get discovered was when she was doing plays in, like, school, and like, high school and stuff like that. And I guess one of the big plays that she did was My Fair Lady. <laughs> um, and even though uh, Julie Andrews was most well-known for doing the play for My Fair Lady, still, um, by the time Julie Orman was in high school, I'm sure, um, Audrey Hepburn had clearly just as much uh, made a name for herself as Eliza Doolittle. So uh, it almost feels like she kind of already had practice in the territory of seeing what else she could do that Audrey Hepburn had already done and see what she could do with it. Um, that's interesting. And I know, and I know, um, some people might come back to this movie and think like, it seems like odd casting just for the fact that Audrey Hepburn was like, you know, will always be a cinema giant. Um, and Julia Ormond kind of, while she's definitely still around, um, she was like, she, hu she was everywhere. She was huge right here in this spot in the mid nineties. And then she just kind of seemed to dissipate in some way. Um, and while that unfortunately just kind of happens, even th even if people are super talented, um, it is interesting to go look 
up what all she's been doing besides her movie career. Um, where she's like a goodwill ambassador and she's been fighting human trafficking and a bunch of other stuff uh, since around this period of time and forward. Um, so she's been she's been busy outside of movies, so there's definitely... She doesn't quite have the reputation that she deserves as far as having been, you know, this big sort of staple of the mid-90s here, but also what she's been doing with her actual life um, is really remarkable. But... Um, Talking about, there's not much else I can say because while Julie Ormond is very good in this and does carry the role, it is un just unfortunately a case of once Audrey Hepburn's done it, just good fucking luck. <laughs> but she does, she's very good, she does carry it very well. Uh, like I said, especially the transformation where she does feel like two different characters between the beginning and then after the transformation. So um, there is that. And talking about our other two main characters here. Um, where we have Bogart and Holden over here, and Ford and Kinnear over here. Um, I think there's quite a bit to say about Bogart here, so, um, why don't we start with the Davids? Um, what I, honestly, just what I like here, I don't feel like David gets the spotlight that he should, uh, in the original as much as he does in the remake, because there are portions of the, there is a whole portion of the movie, and I feel like both movies are victims of this, and it probably does also have to do with the pacing problem that the 95 one already has, and it starts to do it to this one also, is once we get into the portion where Linus and Sabrina are falling for each other, I do feel like eventually both movies sort of seem to grind to a halt uh, in these sort of scenes. Like, the scenes feel like they're kind of repetitive, and it's like, we, we know where it's going, but it's taking forever to get there. And, and both movies suffer from this problem. Um, and I feel like another problem with those scenes is the fact that it feels like the, like the story lessens David's involvement. And it's like seeing all the characters bounce off each other is what the charm of a lot of the movie is. And then when you sort of take out a piece of this for a long period of time, you can tell. And it does feel like there's something kind of missing here from how the characters interact and the whole feel that the that both movies have gotten up to this point. And so, as far as William Holden playing this character, and it's like, to see him playing a character that feels like this comedic, and, you know, does, does scenes like sitting on the wine glasses, or, you know, flipping onto the table after Linus punches him and stuff like that, um, and it's the see you are in love with her thing, but, but him and Kinnear both play that scene very well in very different ways. Uh, and they both really work, and that's like, what I was saying. I feel like the character of David kind of gets shut out of this too early, um, and it's like when he comes back in these later scenes, these climatic scenes, is when you realize how much the character's been missing, um, and it's like, because you do want to buy it as like this love story between Linus and Sabrina and stuff like that, and you want those scenes to really catch fire, um, and I'll, I'll explain why I do think romance-wise, they work with Ford better, um, but, yeah, just the whole idea of David getting shut out, and how Kinnear was able to do this really well also, uh, both the comedic scenes and the more poignant scenes, especially since he was just coming off, this was like his first movie ever, um, we, he, he'd only been doing talk soup up to that point, um, and it's, and he, he, um, he was doing one of those videos where, you know, actors, like, go through their old roles and stuff, and he was saying something like, uh, he felt, when he was working on this movie, he felt like it wasn't even real. Like, it basically felt like a dream where it's like, one minute he's doing talk soup, and the next minute he's on this very, he's been hired by Sidney Paul, like, out of the blue. <laughs> uh, and then, like, everything on this, like, everything that looks so elegant in this movie was apparently the same way off camera. Um, and so, like, taking this person that's essentially a fish out of water and putting them into a movie like this, and... Honestly, Greg Kinnear is an actor that just seems like he was born for the screen. And if it, like if there's any proof that you need for that, it would be to see him in this, where it's just like he seems so... He's, he is taken from something like Talk Soup, put into a Sidney Pollock movie just out of nowhere, and he seems so... He seems like he's supposed to be here. He seems so comfortable in this role, just kind of immediately. Not to mention the intimidating nature of having to play off Harrison Ford in your first movie. <laughs> um, and at this point in the mid-90s, where Harrison Ford was in his stardom at this point, especially, um, it's... 
you know, the way he was able to just do this seemingly so effortlessly as a first movie um, has always stood out to me in this great way. Um, so, to talk about the character of Linus, like I was saying before, if there's a big obstacle these movies have, this whole story has, it's getting past the fact that Linus is not a good guy. <laughs> Linus is kind of a really bad person. Um, and it's like, I mean, yeah, he has his intention. Like, he's not, like, you know, out stomping homeless people on the streets or anything, but he's got one objective in mind, um, which is his his business deals, essentially, and what he's willing to do. Like, he'd be... Like, he's he's more suited for a movie like Wall Street than a romantic comedy. Um, and, he'd be, and he'd be the antagonist in a movie like Wall Street. <laughs> he's that relentless... Um, and like the methodical way he put, he sets the events of this movie, these movies in motion, um, is wild. When you know, Fairchild says at the end of the original movie, "You don't deserve her." That's an understatement. So it's really up to the actors. It's really up to Bogart and Ford to make the to make Linus win the audience over. So. <laughs> That's because we've seen a lot of unlikable characters get a happy ending. Our unlikable characters have a turning point, try to redeem themselves. Um, and like I said, there's maybe a bit more of a redemption with Ford because the ending of the 95 movie is a little longer and he gets a little more time to do that. Whereas this one kind of goes for the classic, you know, romantic comedy ending where he just goes and gets her and then it fades to black. Um, which does feel more like, you know, like classic Hollywood romance. Like, there's there there are certainly romantic moments um, with Bogart and Hepburn, like uh, when the phone booth scene, when she's calling from inside the building, and then he, like, tells her to talk and then puts the phone down and then goes down to her. And they don't really even portray that moment in this, like, traditionally romantic way. Which is very interesting, because it does very much feel like a very romantic moment. And then there's the great thing where um, he's, like, sort of... Like, when he's at the, the board meeting, and the boat that she's on, he can actually hear it. And it's like, there's this these moments throughout that scene where it's like he's sort of haunted by her, uh, that are really well done. And that's, that's stuff that the 95 movie doesn't really capture. But... So me saying that I think Ford works better as the romantic lead than Bogart did is... There's actually a lot of things that go into this. Um, so apparently the relationships between the three main cast members in the original movie were very, very chaotic off camera. <laughs> uh, which might play a part in this, especially since they're all supposed to kind of love each other in different ways. <laughs> um, to my understanding... It started off that it was supposed to be Cary Grant playing Linus. Um, I think even though he's seen... Well, no, he would have been the age at this point that Linus would have been more appropriate. Like, like classic, way back in the like the 30s, Cary Grant would have been a great David. Um, but yeah, 50s Cary Grant, I think, was supposed to be Linus. And it was it was for this really ridiculous reason. He like didn't want to carry an umbrella on screen or something, is why he turned it down. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you have to... Maybe it was a 50s thing, I don't know. But... Um, yeah, so, um, and Bogart didn't really want to do it because he didn't want to work with Hepburn, uh, because, number one, he wanted Lauren Bacall instead, which makes sense. I can't really imagine Bacall as a wallflower. I can, I, I can imagine her as, like, the transform Sabrina, but I don't really imagine her as the wallflower type, but it's understandable why he'd want her. Um, and also that he just thought that Hepburn was a bad actress, which is crazy. Um, but, <laughs> well, she is, she was also really early in her career here, obviously. This was, like, what, she, I feel like she started with Roman Holiday, and this, this was just the very next year. Um, so I guess that Oscar win probably didn't, <laughs> uh, work for him very much, but, um, yeah, so you can send, and he didn't, like, hold in either, but while it was Linus and Sabrina that are supposed to be falling in love, it was actually Hepburn and Holden that were falling in love in real life, it was a fucking mess, from the sounds of it. So, what we see on screen might very well be a miracle. Um, but also three actors who are very, very, very good at their job. Um, regardless of how Bogart felt about them. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, there is a coldness 
to Bogart that you can see here that he's clearly trying to break through. I mean, that's that's the thing is, number one, I feel like coldness was just kind of a Bogart thing in general, but also clearly the Linus character is going to be really cold too. So there's multiple layers <laughs> of Bogart trying to break through a coldness here, um, whether it be how he really felt about, you know, working with Hepburn and then just his sort of general nature and getting into the character. It's a, there's a lot to push through here for the romantic scenes. And in in the early moments, I feel like they're working, but I do feel like the coldness does go on a bit farther than it's supposed to, and I feel like that's highlighted by the Ford performance in the 95 version, where you can see the coldness, you can see the stern Harrison Ford in here, but I also like that he adds a sort of dry comedic nature to Linus that's present through the whole movie. So it's like, you never get the sense that he's like 100% cold. Um, like there is, like it makes, it makes more sense to see Ford in the early scenes of this movie and knowing that he could break through his uh, nature. Like what is, how is it the Bogart character describes himself as uh, unethical, reprehensible, but very practical. Um, <laughs> And it's like, I can see that in both these characters, but it's like, I can also see it's much easier to buy that Ford was able to break through it based on his whole interpretation of the character. Um, and so in these scenes where we do get um, the actual romantic scenes and we get the scene where he's talking about, like, you know, having to follow in his father's footsteps and stuff like that, and stuff like that, like that scene and how good it is shows how good of a call it was in the adaptation process to drop the father character and have him be dead by the time the mo this movie starts. Um, and uh, and then when it does get to those later scenes, like I said, it's like in the scene where he finally goes off and they... Because obviously the different endings here are, instead of it ending in sort of the classic Hollywood way where it's like, oh, they embrace on the way to the destination and then it ends, here they get to the destination and they kind of meet there and then we get this whole other scene that plays out where Linus gets his sort of redemption moment um and and Ford does play this very well but I feel like he he didn't need a redemption as much as Bogart did and Bogart got the the fade out before we even get there thing so and and, and that, that kind of just highlights the whole movie though is that I really appreciate that feeling of like you know classic because it's like it's like classic Hollywood romance, but it's also like fairy tale esque, also, um, in a way, like just the story in general, and that's present in both movies. But um, yeah, I I do think if there's one problem that the ninety five one has, it is that whole being fifteen minutes longer thing and being slower paced and uh, and, and like I said, especially the moments where um. Da like I said, David does get more of a spotlight in this one, but it still feels like the dry spells in this one stand out more. Um, but, yeah, but like I said, that also probably has to do with the length. But like I said, there's, as I've said, I like I prefer Ford to Bogart here. Um, I feel like K Kinnear and Holden are pretty much on an even playing field. But like I said, it's there's just no topping Hepburn. This, and Julia Orman, God bless her for doing what she could because um, she does do it very well. And it's like, if, if we didn't have Audrey Hepburn to compare her to, I feel like this performance would have a lot more behind it uh, as far as, like, support and stuff like that. But it's like, it's just so hard to top Hepburn. And that's the thing also is that because the movie is centered around Sabrina, it's like, I feel like there's more individual aspects I might like about the 95 one. But Hepburn is such a juggernaut of a figure and something that is just so completely unable to be imitated and it's just a height that just nobody can reach. It's, it's like if I'm going to come back to one of these, I'm probably sooner to come back to the Wilder version solely based on Hepburn. Um, like I said, I do like the the way the side characters are done in both of these also, but like I said, I also like the light nature that they're handled with in the Wilder version, where it's, you know, they, they can do just as much with a little less, um, but like I said, it, it, it seems normally to be a good idea to flesh out characters more, but like I said, I could go either way with these, but um, I probably lean towards the Wilder one, but... Uh, yeah, like I said, a lot of that is that burn, but who just could not be topped and probably will never be topped, just in general. Can you imagine 
I don't know if it's been attempted in like maybe a TV movie or something. That'd be the only thing to, with the gall to try, I guess. But um, like, can you imagine anybody trying to do Holly Go Lightly besides Hepburn? I feel like it would be just an absolute disaster. Um, and it's <laughs> like maybe somebody like Orman could, you know, get, do very well, you know, in their own way. Um, but there's just always that shadow, and it's, yeah, you kind of just can't beat that, so, um, you know, like I said, just kind of feeling like a classic Hollywood romance. I do like that, that it, there's moments where it seems like the remake goes for that a little more, even, um, but, like I said, the ending, regardless of how I feel about Linus as a character, um, there's just something about seeing characters embrace and we fade to black, and that's, and then just, it ends, um, just feels like this very, you know, I know you look at it in real life and it's like, oh, what happens after the fade out is probably a disaster, but that's, we know how Hollywood is. We know how it works. We know how their romance movies work. Um, and honestly, those were always the best ones where just an embrace and a fade to black is all we need because that's what movies are. So, <laughs> um, that's how I feel about those, I think. So the next thing is going to be us going to the 70s and the 2000s. I believe. Uh, so that'll be fun. Uh, and the, uh, I've already shot that one, and the, the nature around me, uh, as I was doing that one, is interesting as well, especially with what we're talking about in that video, but before that, um, we're gonna get a review for the new Pinocchio, and I'm also gonna talk about the classic Pinocchio, the, the animated one, and, uh, I think we're gonna get another William Hurt video, and then it'll be the next remake versus, so... Uh, that'll be what the next few things are, so until then, I think that's it.